The problem is a familiar one, and solutions don't come easily. When the problem of moving people isn't severe, buses can often handle it. Buses may economically and effectively handle up to 5,000 people an hour along their routes, as long as they don't get caught in traffic jams. Rail systems handle far more people along exclusive rights of way, but they become economically practical only when handling many more than 20,000 people an hour during peak loading. In between rail transit and buses, there's a problem area where 8,000 people, 10,000 or 15,000 go along a particular route during rush hour. Neither a bus system nor a rail system can handle that load economically. For such a requirement, the transportation industry needs a new idea. Westinghouse has advanced such a new idea. You might say that it's part bus because it looks a little like a bus and even runs on rubber tires. It's also a little like rail transit because it operates on a slim private right-of-way, an expressway. And the idea goes even further, breaking new ground in the field of rapid transit. The cars are light, about one-third the weight and size of a rail car. And they're controlled by an entirely automatic computer system, controlled so precisely that they can be run safely at short intervals around the clock. Single cars during the early hours and multi-car trains at the height of the rush hour and in all an interesting new concept. Westinghouse was granted a contract to build and demonstrate the system at South Park near Pittsburgh. Work soon began on a two-mile demonstration roadway, most of it elevated. The foundations were caisson construction, averaging about 25 feet deep and of reinforced concrete. Each of the caissons was topped by a four foot by five foot pedestal. The system leaves a very small footprint and so uses relatively little costly land when passing through an urban area. The foundation construction is flagpole style because most of the load imposed by the system's lightweight cars is lateral, with comparatively little vertical load. The columns have a uniform profile and are two feet by three feet. Those which bear heavier loads are made of heavier steel plate, but are always the same outer dimensions. Several possibilities have been studied for construction of the roadway itself and stringers fabricated from I-beams were found to be the best choice both for economy and beauty. Down the center of each roadway runs another I-beam, this one to operate as a guide beam. The steering apparatus of the cars will include wheels to ride this beam and steer the trains surely along the roadway. As part of the demonstration, four concrete mixes have been used in the roadway surface to judge their durability. All four mixes were selected for compression strength of 5,000 pounds per square inch and actually all tested at least 25% better. A fifth test section was installed, this one using a polyester silica sand mixture, troweled directly onto a steel and concrete surface. The entire surface was given a brush finish for improved traction. And it was, as everyone had hoped, a beautiful roadway, slim and spare, a roadway that can move downtown through narrow spaces, designed in the hope of saving much of the otherwise enormous cost of rapid transit right of way. A car en route to South Park. This is absolutely the only time it will ever be caught in a traffic jam. The reason why the roadway can be slim and lightweight is that the cars which will ride it are lightweight. The idea behind the cars is simple. The underframe is made of steel, the superstructure and skin of aluminum. This makes them lightweight and relatively small, so they can be operated individually in the early hours of the morning and operate at very low cost. Each car is designed to seat 28 people comfortably, 
with room for 42 standees if necessary. For maximum convenience, the seats are arranged along the side to make boarding and leaving easier and faster. They must be safe and smooth and comfortable so that people will enjoy riding them. Enjoy it enough to leave their automobiles at the station. They will be air conditioned and on cool but moist days they will be dehumidified. The car is guided by wheels riding the guide beam. But just as important, steel discs above the guide wheels safely lock the car to the roadway. The guide wheels steer the car axles so that the car can follow short radius curves of 150 feet or less. The axles, for example, are motor truck type containing differentials. Power is developed at each axle by a 60 horsepower electric motor which is coupled to the differential by a short drive shaft. Every load-bearing wheel is a driving wheel to attain the greatest amount of traction possible. The suspension system uses airbags, helical springs, and shock absorbers. The energy source of the system is three-phase AC power. One immediate advantage of using AC is the lower cost of substations. One of the purposes of the project was to demonstrate the feasibility of such a three-phase AC system. It has never before been done at high speeds. There were problems with the AC system, and most of them centered on the collectors. Three dozen of them were shattered by impacts. In the winter, they were made ineffective by ice buildup. The system's engineers went through three different collector designs before arriving at this one, which has solved the problem. Another advantage of an AC power system is its ability to supply power to all the auxiliary systems aboard each car without need for converters, inverters, or commutators to create maintenance problems. All the circuitry in the propulsion control system is composed of static components built around the unique abilities of the thyristor. The advanced state of thyristor development was another reason why an AC power network was chosen for this system. The cars and trains on the Transit Expressway are robots, performing very few acts which are not totally controlled from the wayside. This robot-style operation is the most unusual aspect of the entire design, a major departure from past thinking in the transit field. The heart of the system is a modern computer. Programmed into the computer is a model of perfect, safe, and economical operation of the system. Usually referred to as part of wayside control, the computer continuously monitors the train's position and velocity and is able to compare what the train should be doing to what it actually is doing and then sends corrective commands. The train's position is indicated visually on a display which is part of the operator's console. And nearby is a typewriter which prints out information fully describing the performance of the system. The operator will speak with people riding the cars through a two-way voice communication system. The computer and the car communicate through an audio tone system using inductive wire loops which run the length of the roadway. As the car antenna couples or comes opposite an upper loop it registers an A signal. As it couples a lower loop, it registers a B signal. These signals are received by the computer as interrupts. By counting the interrupt signals, the computer knows exactly where the car or train is. By noting the frequency of the signal input, the computer can determine with precision the train's speed, acceleration, and deceleration. When the computer has made its calculations, it sends corrective commands by encoding three of six audio tones. The six tones give wayside control a range of 20 possible commands. At present, the system is operating efficiently with the use of 13 commands. The precision and reliability of computer control has made it feasible to run trains 24 hours a day on minimum headways. 
The precision of the computer system has been well demonstrated. The cars, for example, usually stop at a station within plus or minus six inches. Not one computer component failed during the entire test and demonstration period, which involved more than 13,000 hours of operation. When the computer signals the car to use its brakes, a combination of two braking systems goes to work. At first, dynamic brakes steadily slow the car. Then, an air brake system blends in. The blend between the dynamic and air brake system has been so smooth that riders cannot tell when the transition is occurring. A seventh tone is used between the trains and the computer to check the communication channel and as a fail-safe emergency system. Every 66 milliseconds, the seventh tone turns off and on, resetting a circuit on the train. If the circuit is not reset, indicating a failure of some kind, the train automatically stops. A few emergency decisions are made by circuitry aboard the train. This is the only exception to the otherwise complete control of the wayside computer. Any emergency, called a class one condition, brings the train to an immediate smooth stop and prints out the nature of the malfunction. A class two condition runs the train at a slow speed. Class three conditions are very minor and allow the system to operate normally. The operator can take corrective action if necessary. For this demonstration project, a simple transfer table is being used to move cars to and from the tracks. In operational systems, a faster multi-car switching system will be used. The purpose of the South Park demonstration project has not been to perfect the hardware of the system, but to demonstrate the feasibility of the concept. This feasibility has been amply demonstrated. The roadway, for example, has performed very well. There has been no foundation subsidence whatsoever after 15,000 vehicle trips. And both structural sway and beam deflection have been within the norms calculated. In addition, mass transit experts who have viewed the system have agreed that it is a remarkable aesthetic and technical achievement. The design won a first place in the 1966 American Institute of Steel Construction Bridge Competition. The ride qualities of the combined car and roadway system are considered very good. And the engineers have learned ways to improve roadway construction, which will make the ride even better. It's expected that operating systems will offer their customers a ride equal to that of a fine automobile on a modern highway. Many months of testing under all weather conditions have also shown that the Transit Expressway is an all-weather system. Traction of the rubber tires was excellent. Braking was equally impressive. A two-car train moving 40 miles per hour on packed snow was brought to a stop in 360 feet under full control. This type of performance was consistent. Acceleration can be accomplished on normal grades without resistance heat snow melting. This performance led system engineers to decide that no track heating is needed except at stations for stopping. Every conceivable type of emergency, including failure of the trains, the roadway, the communication system, and the computer, was simulated. In every case, with no exceptions, the system performed with absolute safety. The sound level of the system was found to be no higher than the park which surrounds it. Only tire noises and the click of the electrical current collectors can be heard, and these are subdued. Part of the demonstration project has been to conduct a complete study of the system's economics. It has been found that the Transit Expressway has definite potential to pay its own way. For example, cost studies performed for a sample line in Pittsburgh show that with a fare of 25 to 30 cents, 
it may well pay all operating costs and retire all capital indebtedness as well within 30 years. In fact, largely due to its light weight and automation, studies indicate that the system can pay its way with peak hour loads as low as 5,000 passengers per hour. On this basis alone, the demonstration of this new idea in rapid transit has been amply justified. At many times during the latter stages of testing, the people of Pittsburgh and surrounding communities were invited to take rides on the Transit Expressway and to give their opinions. This was considered an important part of the test program since no idea in rapid transit, new or old, can hope to succeed unless people like it. Once again, the verdict was a strong, positive reply. People definitely like the Transit Expressway. Today, the Transit Expressway is being tested for a new purpose, the detailed refinement of its many subsystems. The goal now is improvement in performance, aesthetics, ride, and more economy. It is being readied for full-fledged operation in locations across the nation. The Transit Expressway, a new idea in rapid transit, one designed for routes which need more than bus service, but less than rail service. Its purpose is to supply fast, comfortable, safe, convenient, and economical transportation. On all these counts, its feasibility has been fully demonstrated.